everyone. Welcome to Weekly Roundtable with your Brattleboro State Representatives. I'm Emily Kornheiser, and we also have Molly Burke and Tristan Tolino here, as well as many wonderful guests. We are holding these weekly um, via Zoom at 9 a.m. every Saturday, and then they're rebroadcast on BCTV and the various social media channels. Really happy to continue to have these community conversations through the COVID pandemic that we're in and whatever comes afterwards too. Um, and so we usually start with a brief legislative update and then we've started focusing on specific topics each week. And this week we are focusing on opiates in our community, which is a considerable community challenge. Um, some folks definitely use the word crisis that has not, you know, gone anywhere or gone away through um, all of this time that many of us have spent sheltering at home or working in our essential jobs. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Who would like to start with the legislative update? I can go this time. Um, the uh, uh, just focus, well, there's a bunch of different things. So I think we'll have to team up on getting right all of the things that happened on the, on the floor of the house. Um, but uh, just, I'll start just really quickly with the work in the committee. Um, each of the last couple of weeks, I've mentioned that the governor put together a economic recovery package and, and the house had started to take testimony on that. And um, I wanted to offer that this, um, uh, it, it's a it's a challenging communications challenge uh, to explain the difference between the the governor's approach and the house's approach, um, and and so I'm going to do my best, and I apologize if if this seems uh, wonky and confusing, um, but basically the governor's uh, original proposal um, spends the entire 1.25 billion um, that came in from the federal government very very quickly. And um, already they've spent 275 million in, in emergency response and they got retroactive approval for that from the emergency board of the money chairs and the, that the governor and the money chairs uh, sit on, which is a sort of formal response for validating those kinds of decision-making uh, and, and sort of changing needs uh, outside of the context of what the legislature and the governor can do in sort of normal process. Um, and so 275 million is gone. So we're, and then uh, the governor's initial package uh, had a bunch of programs uh, divided up in different slices to help with the business recovery. And the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee um, has been looking at that. And, and frankly, um, a number of those ideas we found to be not really workable in the way that the governor's team felt you know had originally designed them uh, for a variety of different reasons um, things that were uh, new guidance from the federal government in some cases uh, in other cases uh, sort of a more rigorous assessment of the capacity of the entities that they had hoped to use as a vehicle for scaling up um, and so it's it's complicated the approach and what I think the House has decided to do, or House and Senate have decided to do, is to think of um, the billion dollars in federal stim you know, COVID relief funds in um, two phases, and to start with trying to push money out immediately and you know, intentionally and, and quickly um, to as many of the key places as possible, uh, but also to hold back some of those funds uh, so that in August or September, when we're looking at the full year budget, as opposed to a, a first quarter budget, um, we, if those funds are available to fill the budget gap um, in some way, either in the Ed Fund or in the General Fund, uh, then we have those resources to use um, to think in the big picture and strategically about, about how we respond. If they are still limited in their uh, utility by the federal rules, then we are preparing in advance sort of a second phase uh, of um, targeted use of those funds. So we will not um, not spend the money, 
uh, you know, the intention is to spend the money. The question is where and how. And so the, the primary vehicle right now that's coming out of the House and Senate Commerce uh, and Economic Development Committees um, is uh, using the tax department um, actually to very quickly vet uh, business loss and need and to, to get grant money out uh, to businesses. And we're, I think, starting with 75 million. The administration estimated a potential pool of 80 to 100 million needed there. Um, and, and, and so they're a little frustrated that we've chosen to start with 75, but we are aware that we would, may do a second round of 50 to 75 million in a few weeks. So it's, you know, we're, we want to see what's happening. And part of where we're struggling is that there are some sectors that have been hit more heavily. Um, think of anybody whose business model requires gatherings of any large size. So uh, facilities that are a part of the fairly significant wedding business in the state of Vermont. Uh, tent companies are one example of that we heard from, but there's others. Um, arts, you know, arts organizations, places like that, that have had just catastrophic drops in revenue and really no viable path back to revenue. And what we're trying to do is set up a, a first wave triage system, basically, that says the people who have a disproportionately high loss of revenue because of the nature of their business model get first shot at those um, resources, and then um, and then the second wave will lower the threshold. So we're, you know, our intention is to target restaurants, uh, hospitality businesses, uh, hospitality related businesses, places that are really arts, you know, our example too, places that are really impacted by the gathering restrictions. Uh, and so, so I apologize for the long-winded nature of that, but I did want to set the sort of set the frame around the House and Senate's uh, agreed upon framework for trying to be, be prudent about this. And one final comment, which is that if we don't set that money aside, we spend it all now, then we are creating a potentially $300, $400 million hole in our budgets in August or September. And then we'll either have to dramatically cut programs and services that Vermonters depend on or raise new sources of revenue. And you know, that's why we're protecting that. We're hoping to, to maintain a status quo uh, with those funds so that we neither have to cut services nor substantially raise taxes to close the gap if the federal government changes its rules. And if they don't, then we're going to have to make tough decisions. And I'm done. Thanks, Justin. Um, so we passed the first quarter budget out of the House. Um, it was essentially just a continuation of business as usual because there wasn't really time or information enough to make any changes. And so, um, and it's just a first quarter, usually we do a whole year. And so it's essentially, um, and this is not the language that was used on the floor, but um, it's essentially level funding last year's budget, but just for a quarter so that there's time to make more strategic decisions. And some, um, divisions and um, departments and agencies got more than that first quarter because they spend more of their annual budget in that first quarter than they do in other parts of the year. They don't sort of have a clean, even quarter by quarter budget. Um, like Agency of Natural Resources, for instance, does a lot of work in the summer. So that's that. Um, I'm concerned that we are um, really focused on maintaining business as usual um, when this is not a time for business as usual. This is a time for you know dramatic action and dramatic recovery and um, some really tough decisions. And those tough decisions, um, I don't think are tough decisions about what to cut. I think they're tough decisions about um, where more money can go. And so that's an ongoing conversation um, and we're going to keep on having it um, mm -hmm. because the legislative session is likely not going to end for quite a while. We're going to um, be working um, through the rest of this month and then taking a month off and then coming back for possibly another two months. Um, and so 
the other we've we passed a bunch of other bills this last week yield bill um something about abenaki hunting and fishing rights um whole variety of other things that people can read about if they'd like to or we can sort of put in the chat box um but we also um ordered a lot of bills to be postponed a month and to lie and ordering a bill to lie means like it got out of committee, but there's not really time on the floor for it. And so as we transition into this conversation about opiates in our community, I wanna highlight, um, I'm just being difficult today. And so I'm sorry to my colleagues here. One of the bills that we ordered to lie was a bill that um, decriminalized buprenorphine um, as sort of an available option for folks on the street who don't have prescriptions. And that had made it out of committee and was sort of ready for a vote right before we all got went home for the pandemic and probably won't be something that we discuss on the floor this year and on that note molly what would you like to add sorry i'm like you know feeling a little grouchy today <laughs> um you know the, the the whole issue about what's happening with the funding everything is sort of like in this state where people are like we've got to make sure this happens we've got to make sure that that we get this funded and and to that end there are a, a few different sort of letters that are going out one from the social equity caucus to about you know how to prioritize funding uh one um the women's caucus has been working on a statement of general principles sort of basically saying that you know this is a moment where it's an immediate opportunity to invest in marginalized underserved vermonters and a whole list of of that but sort of boiling down to we need to incorporate um, racial equity um, gender equity and economic uh, equity in in our decisions uh, specifically um, there's a, a document drawn up uh, that emily worked on about that members of the women's caucus signed on to that's a specific sort of ask to the commerce committee about how to how to prioritize um investments in in businesses so it's just and and in the transportation committee that i serve on we have been talking i mean a lot of it that, that we're working on is sort of irrelevant to the moment just miscellaneous motor vehicle things. But specifically, we were given by the speaker, um, if, if you had $5 million to spend with the um, uh, coronavirus relief funds, where would you put it? And we have lots of ideas, but a lot of them don't really match up with the uh, regulations that are in place, the, the, the strictures around the spending. So that's sort of a, a discussion that we're going we're gonna to finish by next week because we have to put our proposal in. One of the things we've talked about is the, the transit and that sort of impacts the um, uh, issue that Susie's here discussed. Transit is now fare free. And uh, we, because of the CARES funding, which provided $20 million to, to public transit, we've been able to all the, and people not wanting to handle money or have people stop uh, at the driver and you know pay the fares whatever so that's that's an issue that we're talking about can we extend that and still be within the guidelines of the coronavirus relief um, and so I just think that and, th and then an acknowledgement in some legislation that we just passed about the importance of the retreat but sort of oversight how the retreat is going to um, how, how, the, how the state is going to have, if it's going to continue funding the retreat, how it's going to, um, how, how the oversight will work. So just, that's just a very broad brush about things. And I'm gonna stop there because I think we have a lot more to talk about with um, the opioid issue. Thank you, Molly. Um, and so the last thing I wanna just um, put clear eyes on that Tristan and Molly both touched on is that while we have this, you know, more than a billion dollars, hypothetically, from the federal government, every week we get more and more restrictions from the feds around how we can spend the money. And so we're trying to thread this incredibly um, fine needle. And it's not um, the places we would want to spend the money to make a difference, even around impacts of COVID, are not available as ways to spend the money. And so that's part of um, 
what you sort of hear us wrestling with. And it seems like this incredibly exciting opportunity, and yet it's a very, very narrow opportunity. So towards all of that, while that's all going on, we still have like people living in our community who are just living their lives. And um, Rosie and Susie, um, you've both been doing some really amazing work on that and how we can turn the curve on a county that from all accounts seems to be the most affected by opioids in the state. Um, so really curious to hear from you if you could like lay some groundwork for us and then also really like a focus on um, what we can do as legislators to make a difference on this. Mm -hmm. Rosie, why don't you go first and kind of give the overview of, of the COSU piece? Does that sound okay? You're on mute. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I can do that and also um, talk a little bit about the data and, uh, or just sort of overview and then if Susie, maybe I'll leave this sort of like, what are we doing um, <laughs> piece to you a little bit. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation to come, um, Emily and all of you. Um, I'm Rosie Nevin Saldifer. Um, I think I know many of you. Um, uh, in the fall, I uh, took over Chad Simmons' position as the director of the Wyndham County um, Consortium on Substance Use. Um, and we have, um, the COSU is a collection of 13 different providers um, and also individuals with lived experience um, with substance use disorder and opiate use disorder in our community. Um, the provider organizations include just about um, anyone you can think of who um, is involved with um, supporting folks with substance use, um, that from the hospital to the retreat to uh, HCRS is my technical employer, um, Turning Point, um, and many others. Um, and uh, the group came together uh, in 2018 to apply for a a one million dollar federal grant, um, or rather to apply for a planning grant to plan the one million dollar planning grant. Um, and so they engaged in a planning process in 2018, assessing the needs um, in our community. Um, and then the implementation grant of the, the programs designed to meet those needs um, began in September um, of this past year in 2019. Um, so, um, and, and then we've also since received um, some new additional funding um, from the Vermont Department of Health um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that'll begin in September as well. Um, so, uh, as far as a, a background on sort of what is happening in our community and Emily or anyone, feel free to jump in and ask specific questions um, if I'm not sort of giving you the, the information that you need um, to be helpful. Um, <clears throat> so the, in a nutshell, story of um, particularly, uh, uh, COSU has a specific focus on um, opiate overdose and, uh, and death prevention. Um, so the sort of history of overdose um, fatalities and losses in our community due to overdose is um, over the last 10 years, there's been an incredible jump since 2015, mm -hmm. um, which all of us who work in the provider community uh, were aware of very closely uh, with the folks that we work with. Um, suddenly started dying in very great numbers. Um, between 2010 and 2015, there were between two, um, two and eight overdoses a year, mostly between two and four overdoses a year, uh, fatal overdoses, that is. And then in 2015, that number started to go up above 10 to 13 to, it peaked in 2018. At, um, we had 25 folks that we lost that year. Um, and that made us um, not only, uh, we have not only the highest overdose rate in the state, um, it's double the Vermont state average roughly for the last three years, um, but also one of the highest overdose rates in the entire country. So um, the states, the other jurisdictions with the highest overdose rates are West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Um, uh, in 2018, they were all in the upper 40s, low 50s in terms of um, number of people per 100,000 who were um, 
dying due to overdose, uh, due to overdose deaths. Um, and Vermont was um, right around uh, 59, I believe. So I have all this data up in front of me on my computer. Uh, in 2019, um, the, the number of fatalities went down um, and we lost uh, 17 people in 2019. Um, which brought the overdose rate down to 39 people per 100,000. Um, and so everyone was um, very pleased, obviously, that we were moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, a, lot of, of, a lot of folks are obviously working very hard. Um, but um, since the onset of the pandemic and social distancing and um, the, the um, impact that that's had on on our ability to connect with folks in person and for people to connect with their support circles um, since march we've had unofficially this is from mostly first responder data it hasn't yet been confirmed um, by the state coroner's office but we believe there's between six and seven um, overdose deaths um, in our community just in the last um, two and a half three months um, whereas in january and february february january i believe we had zero and I think February, there were two, one or two. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so pretty dramatic, um, the effects uh, that that's had on our community. So that's sort of the um, short, not so short history of, um, of how our, our community has been impacted in recent years by um, opiate loss i could expand on kosu is you know broadens the focus of loss to other forms of permanent loss not just loss to to you know loss of life but um termination of parental rights um loss of of connection with families of origin um homelessness we feel is a, a, a form of permanent you know, loss of housing um deportation incarceration there's lots of forms of of permanent um and extended loss that um, our community um, is impacted by. So um, yeah, have have lots to say um, on any or all of that, um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Susie or let mm -hmm. folks jump in before I say more. Thank you, Rosie. And uh, thanks for having us here this morning for this, uh, this important conversation. Uh, it, yeah, it's certainly, it's been a trying time for everyone. And uh, we already know that people who struggle with substance use uh, disorder, with all of those other factors, the homelessness or uh, corrections involvement or uh, perhaps job instability, all of those things um, for which our community has a lot of uh, rich resources, including uh, peer recovery supports at Turning Point. Um, and what we've been seeing is that uh, there's so much a part of recovery that's about connection and community that as soon as uh, we all went remote and we did it pretty quickly at, at turning point we um, on March 17th we decided to close to the public but we have recovery coaches who uh, give uh, check-in calls and do recovery coaching by phone during the day and we have an online recovery group um, each day as well. And uh, in our emergency department coaching program continues and our mom's program continues. Um, so we're doing the best we can and we're being as creative as we can. Um, but there were certain things that came to a stop and, uh, and as much as it was uh, interesting being creative and going uh, virtual with so many things, um, there are a lot of people who just don't connect that way, either literally that they don't have reliable service or devices, or that, um, that an in-person support is, is just kind of what they need. And so it's, it's been um, very challenging that way. And as uh, what we do see, the good news is that people who are in recovery and who are getting these coaching calls and participating in groups, our coaches are reporting that people are on the phone a lot longer, that um, it used to be they might get a five or 10 minute uh, check-in call. And um, one of our coaches was on the phone with somebody for five hours uh, last Saturday because uh, the person was in crisis, not in a way that they needed to go to treatment or 
or, you know, to, to make a resource move of some kind, but because, uh, you know, they're scared and lonely and, and really very alone as far as a community. So um, we are seeing that people in recovery are really latching on to what they have and trying not to uh, lose it. But we're also seeing people uh, relapse. And we're seeing, you know, unfortunately, we've had a lot of loss and um, it ripples through our own work staff too because they've supported these people through one program or another, or maybe they, former, they knew them personally or formerly uh, were involved with them. And um, so it makes us want to do more at a time that we're hindered from doing more. So um, uh, let's see, one thing we're doing that we're starting next week, Project CARE had been kind of on hold um, because we weren't going out doing that community outreach, but we are resuming that. And an idea the emergency department coaches had was to um, make themselves available at different picnic tables around town to be able to sit down with people in a, in a you know, safe, responsible way and still have that person-to-person -person connection and conversation. So we're starting that next week as well. And we're trying to do more innovative things online because, I mean, we all have a lot of these meetings, we know, but if you're if you're used to having recovery group support, you know, there's only so many meetings you can attend and, and before you kind of feel like it's stagnant. So we've got the moms group is starting a, a book club next week um, using a book called Sober Moms Guide to Recovery. And so we're creating little gift bags of, of, um, of the book. And there's a book about how to talk to children about coronavirus and some other things that we hope will draw people in. So we're just, you know, like all of us, we're trying to be innovative, but it's been painful um, to see that we know there are people that are, we're not connecting with. Uh, oh, I'm back. Rose for a second. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're back. Technology. I'm back. So um, let me see. We know we're not connecting with everyone. So uh, we reached out a few weeks ago. Um, actually, I was on a podcast with um, Peter Case and I, we had a wonderful response about this limitation of people not having devices. And um, Steve West in the Brattleboro area mutual aid tech group, um, we're getting to work with Millicent Cooley who's on the call here. Um, we are collecting donated phones that can be um, repurposed to use and give to people who simply would get on a call or a, uh, an online group if, if only they had the device to do so. So we're trying to do what we can there. Um, we're getting some help from the state, probably with some of the money you're talking about, but um, it comes with all these limitations. We wanted to be able to actually provide device or phone card minutes or something to these people who, who do have this barrier, uh, but the money can't be used for that particular purpose. So we're gonna be hiring another outreach worker who specifically will be working around um, COVID related challenges that are affecting our um, substance use uh, community. So, um, I mean, I guess the good news is we're being as creative as we can and we're still in business. Um, and we're just hoping, uh, we're thinking July 1st, we'll start to have a limited um, hours at the center again. And we cap it at 15 people in the building at any, at, at any time. We've got plenty of masks and we've got our procedures and all, but. Um, you know, it's been a real struggle that um, we certainly want to keep people safe because there are tens of thousands of people dying of COVID. At the same time, substance use is taking tens of thousands of people every year. So um, we want to respond to our community. We want to keep our staff safe. And it's, it's like walking through a minefield right now. So we're grateful for the partnerships we have through the COSU and through Project Care and just, you know, the rich relationships we have in our community because we do, we just reach out to each other all the time and say, we can't find any place this person's ready for treatment. 
and being put on um, a list for two weeks just doesn't work. And what can we put, what kind of safety net can we put in place until that can happen? Because that window of willingness sometimes is, is very short. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what's going on right now. And I'm, I'm glad to take any questions. So I would, my first question, um, and then sort of opening it up to broader mm -hmm. questions, um, is <clears throat> what you said, Susie, about that limited window, for instance, and how some mm -hmm. is sometimes get people in treatment. What are, what are things we can do to keep people from dying? Uh, yeah, uh, the connection that if, um, well, certainly quicker access to treatment when people want it. And, you know, and sometimes even now when a lot of the different rules have been, there's a little more flexibility in some ways now, um, you know, with all the telehealth we're doing and um, uh, certain things are happening um, that, you know, you may not know that our uh, police department through Project Care is so, um, if there's somebody in custody who is on MAT, medication assisted treatment, it used to be that you would just have to go without during that period, but they've worked with Habitopco and the retreat to make sure that people can still continue to get their medication. So that's wonderful. That's a great way we can keep people alive. Um, so we're looking at things like that and just by reaching out to each other. Um, yeah, the treatment issue is really hard because uh, they have limitations about how many people they're taking. So if we, what we're trying to do is make stronger connections with our recovery coaches. Um, uh, for instance, during this trans transitional period, if uh, before we get back to whatever our normal is going to be, um, we want to uh, create a stronger connection um, through the folks that are housed um, at the hotels uh, and Groundworks, again, doing amazing work helping people to get access to medication assisted treatment and to other supports, but uh, there's just something uh, a little different about when somebody with personal lived experience talks to another person. So we're trying to, we all had to move really fast when all of this happened, but we wanna have um, a closer connection there and a closer connection through the emergency department program too, because we've been working remotely, which works well enough, but not as well as um, if we could safely meet people in person, at least that first visit. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of what it's been for a while is access and to, if you're a garden variety alcoholic, my goodness, you should be able to go to detox someplace. There, there just always seems to be some kind of hoop to jump through. And yeah, if we're trying to pe keep people alive, does it really matter? <laughs> does it really matter what the substance is? Um, mm. Yeah, so access in a lot of ways is an answer. Thank you. Rosie, do you want to add to that? <clears throat> You're muted. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've been making a little, little list here of legislative asks. Um, I mean, I, I think that the short answer is, is that if we all knew exactly what we had to do to keep people from dying, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm -hmm. um, I think I have a whole little list of things here. I think along with what Susie was saying, um, really asking, I mean, you all are in a position of power where often when you ask things, people give different answers than when other folks ask them. So, um, you know, using that to, uh, to, to ask our, you know, our treatment facilities in the state of Vermont, when folks say, we like to talk about how we have no wait lists in Vermont and um, mm -hmm. that folks are really proud of that. And so I think really, um, you know, and those of you who are at the round table with, with Congressman Welch um, this past Thursday, um, Rihanna had like probably the most eloquent framing of it that I've heard, but um, you know, and you say <coughs> there's no wait list, but uh, you know, you can't get somebody into treatment for a week who, ha who has to go that day and that window is so small. Um, you know, we like they say, oh, sure, yeah, we have a bed for them on Tuesday, but it's Wednesday. And so, in fact, there is a wait list, um, you know, even though we, we say that there's not. So, um, to really, you know, when, when we say things like that, and I think sometimes we're a little more self congratulatory of the work that we're doing, which is good. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm, pr I'm really proud of, of um, 
this community and and all that we are doing and um <clears throat> there's always so much more room to grow and so i think just really holding um holding institutions accountable for that and and asking what they mean when they say things like that um and that we really need rapid access um, mm -hmm. to, um to beds um when people need them um i think the other thing um i have a bunch of little things here so i'll just go down the list one um this was also mentioned on thursday but um, one thing that has been very helpful is the flexibility around cross-state licensure um, to access telemed services um, either in New Hampshire or Massachusetts. We're so close to the border and opening that up has opened up, um, a, mm -hmm. you know, a whole new world of provider choices for people. Um, and so I think continuing to think about that, everyone is, is curious to know what's going to happen with, um, <coughs> you know, telehealth regulations as we go along if they're going to be rolled mm -hmm. back um, so just to just to be thinking about that and how much access um, to more services that allows us um, and to try and keep that in place um, for as long as possible and that some of that is federal and beyond your control but to the extent that you know Vermont, Vermont um, licensure is involved um, that would be very helpful I think um, asking for and using data to inform um, <clears throat> our, our interventions and funding and, um, and all of the things. One of the incredible benefits of the um, HRSA grant that we got, well, one of the incredible bears of the grant is the <laughs> amount of data collection that it requires um, from <clears throat> providers and community members. Uh, it, it is extraordinary. But on the other side of that, um, we have access to a whole new world of data all in one place that we've really never had before. It's mm -hmm. all lived in sort of separate places with blueprint or with you know individual providers. Um, so I think one of the great benefits of COSU is the sort of bird's eye view um, that it gives us of, of what is happening in our community in terms of um, services and challenges. So um, anytime anyone, mm -hmm. any kind of data related to substance use or opiate use in our county, please feel free to reach out. Um, I very likely have more than you want to look at. So um, yeah, I would love to provide that to you in, in a way that's useful to you and your work. Um, and then uh, funding for harm reduction um, and also just continuing to raise, um, right, you know, talk about harm reduction uh, in a way that continues to destigmatize it. Um, again, um, you know, as legislators, when, when you talk about things, uh, it, it uh, reflects differently than say when we talk about things. Um, or Rosie, when I don't know if um, everyone knows what harm reduction is. So I wonder yeah. If so um, so one of the best uh, one of the best data informed um, methods of keeping people alive is the idea that um, it is the idea of placing public health interventions above um, this sort of like encouragement for folks to go to treatment before they're ready. And that the number one priority is that we keep people alive because mm -hmm. um, no one can get to recovery if they're not alive. So um, that includes things like um, Narcan, which we already, you know, is pretty prolific in our county, um, could be more so in the more rural parts of the county, which we're working on. Um, Narcan uh, is the brand name for naloxone, which is um, a drug that reverses the effects of opiates. Um, so if it's given within a certain time frame after an overdose, um, it can reverse the overdose. And that has been um, one of the most effective ways um, to reduce fatalities um, mm -hmm. with, with opiate use. But it requires a large scale um, community conversation and, and also an understanding around um, safe use um, and, uh, and the adoption of you know, never use alone practices. If you're mm -hmm. using alone, even if you have Narcan, Nobody's there to give the Narcan. So there's a whole spectrum of things. Um, and then um, the, the use of um, syringe services programs that provide um, new needles um, so that folks can use a new needle every time. That de helps decrease uh, mm. the spread of infectious diseases in our community, as well as um, acute infections within individuals, um, mm -hmm. which especially right now is really important to keep um, folks out of hospitals and also the burden on the healthcare system down, really making sure that folks have access um, to, su to supplies that helps them use safely. 
Um, and so historically, both locally and nationally, um, you know, the, the counter argument to harm reduction is that you are um, giving folks the supplies they need to use drugs and or telling people how to use drugs and or in some way, like encouraging people to use more drugs than they already are. So um, that's been, you know, if anyone um, wants more information, why <laughs> um, I feel strongly that that's not the case. There's a, a boatload of evidence um, behind that. Um, and it is one of the most evidence-based interventions um, to, to really to keep people alive. So that's our first goal, keep people alive and then mm -hmm. you know, support mm -hmm. them um, to get the supports that they need. Um, and then my last request, um, I know somebody mentioned transportation, uh, or a number of people have. Um, transportation to treatment is very difficult. Um, most people, if they, want, if they need to do like a medical detox, need to go up to um, a facility like Valley Vista, um, which is far away can't remember the exact town, about an hour and a half from here. For Jens. Yes, thank you. For Jens and Bradford. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and, and um, you know, and there are, um, for folks that have Medicaid insurance, sometimes, the big sometimes, people can get a ride uh, through, through Medicaid rides. Um, more often than not, that's not the case. And for folks that don't have insurance or have a different kind of insurance, we rely on um, really recovery coaches um, heavily mm -hmm. um, to provide transportation in their own private vehicles. So um, figure, trying to figure out another solution to, to help people physically get to the treatment that they need that doesn't exist within our community um, in a is timely that a way. Systemic, is that systemic through all parts of Vermont, um, the, the transportation mm -hmm. issue, or is that a particularly acute problem for us in Windham County? So I work for Medicaid. I'm a, I work for Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, which is part of the AHS DIVA um, program. I'm on the ground. I'm an RN case manager. Oh, your sound went away. Uh -oh. Oh, unmute. Can't hear you anymore. Can you? I don't think you can hear us either. Hmm. Um, oh, you're back. we missed a lot of what you said. Yeah, my internet's unstable. If you turn off your video, sometimes the audio improves. Okay. Um, well, let me just, so if you um, have Medicaid, if someone has Medicaid, um, Rosie, if they're denied a Medicaid ride, that can be very quickly appealed if you know who to call. <laughs> and the question is who you call. And that's across the state. Scott, Scott, Scott Strenio, who is the uh, chief medical officer of Medicaid, will personally make sure that someone gets a ride. If it's going to keep the cost down, you know, if they're going to get into treatment rather than stay out of treatment or require more emergency room visits, the cost effectiveness of getting someone into treatment mm -hmm. um, is, is beneficial by um, getting approval for the ride. So you can contact me if that's an issue in Wyndham County. I cover all of Wyndham County for Medicaid recipients. I have a follow-up, and I see that Molly wants to speak to it. Yeah. Well, I just want to ask a specific question, uh, Glenn. Um, now that we're providing uh, free fare on the on the buses, is that still a an issue right now? So when people are in crisis, typically they need to be driven. Um, taking a bus is not. Okay. I have not felt like that's an option with my clients who are in crisis and need to get to a bed. Um, uh -huh. So I would not mm -hmm. think that that would be highly effective. Mm -hmm. it but as but are you um, saying that there might be need need for more money to pay drivers? Is that the or just or these are volunteer drivers? My it's experience so with Medicaid rides is that you, it, sometimes getting an approval is difficult, but once you mm -hmm. have an approval, the the um, regularity of that approval working out um, for a wide variety of reasons is very difficult. Um, and so that's that always is, struck me yeah. less of a funding issue and more of an administrative. Um, yeah. That, that's my not my experience, but when I'm in the Medicaid system, I know who to call, and people who get stuck know to call me, and then I bring it right up the ladder pretty quickly to get to get it to happen. But yes, people report that administratively that's difficult, and I'm not sure if that's a user system, if that's a problem with the subcontractor for Vermont Shared Rides and Transportation, 
But my experience is that when you have a person specifically identified to work with Medicaid clients, and if there is a problem, that's brought on a weekly basis to the team to be discussed. Uh -huh. I, I'm just, I'm on the Public Transit Advisory Council, and there's a meeting in a couple of weeks, and I just, you know, maybe I should talk to you a little bit more to get more specifics about okay. if there's any anything that can be done on the, with the state public transit system. Okay. Well, I, I hear repeatedly what Rosie was saying was that the the logistics seem to be difficult. I don't have that problem, but I repeatedly hear that. So Rosie, if you and I can talk when that happens or you and I can mm -hmm. communicate and I can maybe help shed a light on what the easiest way to get that to move forward would be, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. I see some yeah, other the other thing that, that is very um, prevalent for me, I had mentioned it in the chat, is that um, the etiology of this opioid use is significant to, and needs to be looked at in terms of, so if we're playing catch up in terms of what do we do for harm reduction once people are addicted and once people are needing detox and once people are needing rehab, my question that I'd like to pose from a medical perspective, because I am a registered nurse and have been doing, I've been a nurse since 1979, worked in Spanish Harlem, in inner city Philadelphia, so I get poverty and I get I get a lot of things, but, but one of the things that I find difficult in Vermont is that there is limited access to adequate pain management, especially since the opioid crisis. What's happened is that the docs have been given a mandate to cut down in terms of what is reasonable and necessary. Those are the key words, reasonable and necessary, to prescribe for people who have real pain. When they don't get the pain treatment that they need, what's happening is they're going to the streets and losing. And I think that's pretty significant to look at in terms of the pressure that the docs are under and or what other options do we have in terms of pain specialists within Wyndham County? Do we have, now we supposedly have an integrated medicine system at the retreat, but really what it consists of is not integrated. It's, it's a little bit of a misnomer. There's a, a, a psychiatric, uh, a PsyD, a psychologist, doctoral psychologist, um, there is um, a, an occasional occupational therapist and someone who does some yoga training and stretching. Um, and they teach people how to cope with having pain, but they don't get to the problem of resolving pain or really looking in uh, neuroplasticity, um, treatment of um, pain in terms of other outside ways, um, other medications that might work, um, Suboxone, um, you know. So the docs are left, the primary docs, whom we have a shortage of, are left with having to treat pain and it's, 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 they can't, their, their hands are tied legally, um, ethically, and they don't have the specialty. So what about yeah. acupuncture? Is that, but who's going to order the acupuncture? Yeah, that's what I mean. I just wonder. That. Yeah. And, 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 and so those whole, and then it's not covered. Things. Yeah. No, but, I think but in addition, people who have real severe nerve damage pain from crushing construction injuries and things like that, they mm -hmm. are not getting the, the medical treatment that quells their need for pain management. And then what happens is they give up and they go out and they buy it on the street. And then they become addicted and then they lose their housing and then they become a housing first issue and then they and, and then they become a whole drain on the system. And I really think that's a component I did not see in other cities where I've worked. Thank you, Glenn. Um, that is a lot to think about with um, how our integrated pain management system could do a better mm -hmm. job um, on the prevention end, though I don't like to think of anyone as a drain on the system. I see a question from Bob in the chat box about if we know the housing situation of the folks who did I who have OD'd since March. So several of those people were my clients. Um, and wait, wait, Glenn, can you wait one second? Because I think Bob might want to use some okay. words and his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, either the housing situation or any any particulars regarding those six to seven people that came to your attention in March. And yeah, so those are people that I, that I not all of them, but I have worked with them, most of them at one point or another in the last number of months. In March, we lost contact with them um, as Susie identified that 
trying to find people who don't have cell phone service. Q-Link is a wonderful system, ideally, but it's not, it's not a system that is user-friendly, many barriers for people to try and get the free Obama phone. Um, so losing contact with people, Groundworks is not able to provide, even if the person has housing, they are not a Groundworks is not. Oh, I think we lost you again. Bye, Susie. Thank you so. Thank you so much for having me. You're in good hands with Rosie. Bye, bye. Um, and then Rosie, I think you wanted to jump in. Um, um, thank you. Yeah, I don't have much more information, but a little bit. Um, and uh, the short answer is many of them are housed in the in the motels. Um, that Groundworks manages. Um, at least one person passed away at Phoenix House, um, and uh, and I I do recommend um, if folks there's a recording I can send to you, Emily, to send it around of the of the roundtable with Congressman Welch. Um, Rihanna shared um, some more information around um, those overdoses. Most were um, found by Groundworks staff and tried to revive um, these individuals and they were not able to do that. Um, some, uh, one per at least one person was transported um, while alive and was in critical care. Um, and um, they, they were, my understanding is these were folks who were well connected um, to resources. Um, they had many resources even on their person. Um, and uh, it's it's very challenging. I know not nationally. I've been I've been wanting to follow up um, with law enforcement to see if they have a sense here locally. I know nationally what is happening. Um, one of the one of the best harm reduction tools that people have available to them is to consistently buy product from the same person um, that they have a level of trust with. And um, since the onset of the pandemic. Um, you know, everybody is, uh, it, you know, in different places and has been dislocated, um, including folks who sell drugs. So um, finding the same person that folks are used to buying from is more difficult. So people may be buying from people they're unfamiliar with and unfamiliar with the product that, that those folks sell. Um, and so the dosing may be different, um, you know, or the, the um, you know, what they're, uh, what they're taking, you know, they, be, they may be taking um, what they believe to be, you know, a, a level that they've tolerated in the past, but it's a different product. So um, it, it um, proves to be fatal. Um, there's also nationally, there's been a trend of, um, you know, product is less available. So um, folks are essentially rebranding. I mean, most drugs sold on the street have specific names that they go by. Um, it's just like brand names with any other product. Um, and so folks are, uh, you know, substituting one product for another, but marketing it as something else. So somebody may buy a product that they're familiar with that name. They've taken it before. They have an idea of the strength. Um, and so they take the same strength that they, they you know, have taken in the past, but it, it is in fact a misbranded different product. Um, and so um, that has, um, contributed to the spike in overdose deaths um, nationally. Again, I don't know how much exactly that is playing out here locally. Um, and so I like I, I would like to do some more research on how much that is contributing, but I suspect that um, it, is, uh, it is a factor. And then um, just the one other thing I was going to mention about Medicaid rides. Um, one, one challenge um, that we hear from the community is that it's not necessarily in fact a, an administrative issue, but a stigma issue. Um, and we have at least one Medicaid ride contractor um, who calls it the druggy buggy when she gives rides to folks to get access to um, MAT um, and or treatment. And so that's a problem. <laughs> um, and so I think again, just speaks to um, the responsibility that we all need to take um, to loudly change the conversation in the way that we are talking about um, substance use and opiate use disorder, this medical public health crisis uh, that is um, killing folks in our community all the time, almost every week at the moment, um, and really changing the conversation around that. So um, COSU is working on um, ways to do that, that we could do that sort of on a larger, more coordinated scale um, throughout the community. I think certainly Wyndham County has 
has done that um, with various issues in the past, um, kind of taken responsibility to change the conversation and to have conversations with their neighbors in a different way um, and to teach folks. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's a big factor and, um, and something that we are definitely working on, but there's multiple layers to this um, from funding to administrative to just plain old stigma, so. Um, Thank you, Rosie. Um, it is 10 o'clock and that feels like a really um, poignant spot to stop. Really appreciate what you said. It seems like there are a lot of conversations um, that we need to be shifting in our community right now between opiates and racial justice and poverty and sickness and privacy in many pieces. So thank you very much everyone who came today and for everyone who's going to watch in the future. and. Um, Really looking forward to following up with any and all of you that want to keep on having this conversation and doing the good work in the State House to move those pieces along, as well as um, our conversation next week, which is going to be focused on what we can do for racial justice in our community and statewide. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to take us off live now.